I want to mention to you that we have recently come into understanding a little at a time and it was all started when Norman first brought a message about the witches putting the souls of people in jars down in Guatemala which uh, everybody's mouth dropped open when he dropped that on us here at the workshop but uh, we turned that around in our minds and turned it around in our minds and it got to be uh, well it's in Annihilating if you haven't heard it it's all written down I quoted him and uh, because I thought it ought to be dropped on everybody since it startled us so but the whole concept is that the witches were able by witchcraft to extract parts of a person and imprison that part of them and keep it from functioning and replace it with something else that made them amenable to the witch's witch wishes. Now that was where we started and then of course Dr. Haggard, that funny veterinarian, he got tangled up and all of a sudden when he was praying with some woman here one time after that the Lord impressed him. She came out of a Roman Catholic background and the Lord impressed him that the soul of that woman was imprisoned in the Vatican. Vatican means hill of the soothsayer. And so uh, you know how Dr. Haggard is. He doesn't stop at anything. He just uh, asked the Father in Jesus name to send an angel over to the Vatican and find that soul wherever it was imprisoned, break the seal on it, break the bondage and bring it back and put it in that lady where it belonged. And he did. And there was a tremendous change in the woman. Later on some people here ran into something of the same sort and one of the boys brought me news that they even found a spirit that had been put in place of that soul named Zadius. And he had been put there to take the place of that which had been extracted. Well we know that the soul consists of the mind, the will, and the emotions. Now we have come to understand through some of our members who have been working with some of their own children, they, just, they brought me this news that they had discovered that parts of the soul had been extracted from their children. Not the whole thing, but parts of it. When they told me this, the whole thing began to take shape. The, the idea of the whole mind, will, and emotions being extracted, I thought, how could that be in the person still function? You know, the, the entire thing. But if you're talking about a piece of the mind, a piece of the will, a piece of the emotions being... Re and this is the news that they brought in practical working, that a part of the child's mind, for example, on a certain subject, had been removed and taken out and bound. And the child couldn't think straight on that particular subject. He could think straight about a lot of other things, but on that piece, he was at sea. Now this is a new concept, don't feel individual. We're moving out into virgin territory again, but I sense in my spirit that it's a tremendous breakthrough that's going to help us restore a lot of the, had you, you, you know the old 23rd Psalm, our old favorite? He restoreth my soul. Why? Why should he restore our soul? Because somebody's been tampering with it. Somebody's been nibbling away while we were unaware of where the trouble lay. I can see the light is clicking. Boy, I can hear the brain wheels just chug, 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 chug out there. When you think about this some more, you let it simmer and you lay it out before the Father. And find the scriptures on souls. We're doing a, an in-depth research right here, around here now. People are digging, digging, digging to find all the scriptures about the soul. Tie this in with the message that Norman brought on the 13th chapter of Ezekiel on the witches hunting the souls of the righteous and making them fly. To fly, you know, when I think of a bird flying, I think of it flying out. And that's exactly what happens. Pieces. So they, uh, they found that parts of the emotion were captured. Just as this talks about in Ezekiel. And were set apart. Let me stop here just a moment. 
for fear somebody thinks I'm picking on the Roman Catholics. I guess I am. Uh, <laughs> not the people, the system. Because it's the system. The people can be wonderful people, certainly. But the system that they're snared in is a very wicked system. And you'll find an annihilating, I'll, I'll, before I jar your pure minds, it's down in black and white, that the power that's running the Roman Catholic Church is black witchcraft. And it's the same as ceremony witchcraft. This came when a Jesuit priest, his testimony is in Annihilating chapter, verse, uh, book 1. And he found, as a lost person seeking for truth, going into the occult, he found that the sacramental system of the Roman Catholic Church and everything they were doing was the same thing as magic in the witchcraft realm. He found the parallel before he was ever even saved. And this helped to dis disillusion him about the whole system. And he eventually was saved, thank God. Baptized in the Holy Spirit and got delivered over in Buff Buffalo. Isn't that great? His testimony's in there. It's also on the testimony tape. But the mind, the will, and the emotions can be and is being affected by various forces. And in some way by the magical system of baptism, confirmation, and other sacramental ordinances, a part of the mind, a part of the will, a part of the emotions can and is extracted and is stored at a distant place. Thank God, believers who have authority to loose angels can do something about it. Now you think about it. Then you'll find that other things have caused fragmentation of the mind, the will, and the emotions besides witchcraft. And this is what's on that tape where we were, taught, we're, we're hassling with this demon about the fragmentation of the boy. And I, the Lord brought this to my mind about the, the new concept of mind, will, and emotions. And I said, I think you fragmented his, his will and his mind through those drugs. He said, no, no, don't do that. And we went to work. And I began to loose angels. I said, angels, I want you to go and find the pieces of his mind, wherever they've stored them, wherever they've hidden them. Go immediately in Jesus' name, break the seals, the bondage. Just like it says, doesn't it say break the yoke? Doesn't it say set the captives free? Doesn't it say liberate them? And I said, bring it back and put it in place. They had, there were areas of confusion and inability to think and reason in the mind. There were areas of the will that did not work when it ought to work. Did you ever go to stop a car with hydraulic brakes and you pushed confidently on the pedal and it went all the way to the floor? And you seemed to pick up speed instead of slow down? Frightening thing, especially at an intersection. Boom. That's sort of the way it is when a piece of the will has been extracted and the person is heading into a situation where they need to will to avoid it and they will and nothing happens. They slide right on in. The emotions can be affected likewise. Are you beginning to see the possibilities? Now I'm telling you, I'm not, I told you I was just going to give you some seed thoughts to think about. You can break the yoke of bondage that's mentioned in Isaiah. You can do it by the authority of the name of Jesus Christ's blood and you can replace it with the yoke of Jesus Christ in Matthew 11, 28, 29. Take my yoke upon you and you can do that. Have the angels break the one yoke and put the yoke of Jesus in place of it. For his yoke is easy, his burden is light. And um, look over at... Um, Let's look at Proverbs 3. We need always, you know, to loose, uh, we can always loose spirits to replace those that, are, that we've taken out. And Proverbs 3, look down to verse 20. By his knowledge the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. My son, let not them depart from thine eyes. 
Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. There are some spirits you can lose. The knowledge of the Lord. You can uh, sound wisdom and discretion. And life. You can lose in place of what the enemy has put there. Look back at the second chapter of Proverbs. Verse uh, 10. When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant to thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things. Here's some more spirits you can loose into the person to help them to hold the ground that you're regaining in Jesus' name. And like I said, that's not the whole picture, that's not the whole thing, but that'll give you something to go on. And I suspect if you will do as we have done and plunge in and check it out, you'll find that sure enough, fragmented mind, fragmented emotions, and fragmented will are in there. In the trail of drugs, and I would say in the trail of alcoholism, or other, uh, in the trail of heavy rock music, all of these things that tend to destroy and demoralize the personality, you're going to find that the enemy has done a job on the person. The idea is even after they get free, in Jesus' name, that they're still to be captives. I think it's time we take up the club and hunt them down, don't you? And break them out wherever we find them. Now I want you to turn to Acts chapter 7. That's one way you can march against the enemy. March in and destroy his nest. Look at Acts chapter 7. Look down to verse 51. There was a man named Stephen. And he was a good man. He worked many, many good things for the uh, glory of the Lord. Did he not? And if you look over in the... He was taken uh, into charge. Look back to verse 6 uh, to get the background of what happened to him. Verse 8, Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. That's the kind of fellow I'd like to be around, wouldn't you? Did great wonders and miracles among the people. And then there arose certain members of the synagogue. That's the religious crowd. And they began to dispute with him. But verse 10, they could not resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. The Holy Spirit gave Stephen wisdom and he gave him the knowledge and understanding to refute all of the arguments these fellows were bringing up. And of course, they should have said, well, praise the Lord, I'm glad you showed us where we were wrong. That's not what they did. Yes, sir? Uh, you said chapter seven. I'm in chapter 6. I backed up. Excuse me. Backed up to get the, ver get the background. Chapter 6, verse 7, or verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Now you'd expect, well, they'd say, well, we give up. You've convinced us. You'll find out religious enemies don't do that. Demonically driven religious enemies, and this is what they were, said, we've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses, against God. Now that was a lie. The only blasphemous words they had heard from their standpoint was the fact that he, he dumped over their theological tables. He upset their religious apple cart. And he answered them in front of the crowd and they had no answers. And so the best thing to do was to discredit him. Guess what? That tribe hasn't died out. Stephen is marching against the enemy. He marched right into their den. If you want to find out where the enemy's really got his fortress, you don't have to go to the adult bookstore. Go into the church, any church, and there you'll find his big place. Whenever God builds a house of prayer, the devil always builds a temple there. And twill be found upon examination, the latter has the largest congregation. Anytime God sets up 
a movement of God's people when the devil can't stop it by direct opposition he joins it that's right You'll find that all through the Bible, Old and New Testament, when the work of God cannot be stopped any other way, the devil immediately has people join it. That he's controlling. That he's pulling the strings to. And the idea, you see, is to get enough of his folks in there to outweigh the folks that are moving with the Lord. The reason the devil hates the deliverance church is because it's hard for him to get his folks in. And it's even because they don't want to go in there. They don't like it in there. They don't. And it's even harder for him to keep them in because they get so slick and slippery. You know, their way is dark and slippery and they're always, they, they don't like it there. That's why your deliverance group stays so small. Let me tell you, after 10 short years of experience with this deliverance thing, I can tell you this much from the standpoint of a pastor in a church people are sent to you we won't discuss which one sent them they come from the Lord or from the other side the way we get members I tell them the door opens both ways I didn't ask you to come if God didn't tell you goodbye you say well you'll never build a big church won't that be great and we'll all know each other. We'll know who's who. Some of these people have been killed by success. Did you know that? One of the worst things that can happen to a group of believers that are really going is to suddenly mushroom. Then they have more to do than they can handle. They can't, they can't watch everything. They can't keep it going. Whereas before when they're a tight, compact group praying together, staying together, bracing each other, all of a sudden now you're running in all directions and what are you going to do? You say, well, you don't sound like you want to build a big church. Uh-uh. I think five medium-sized churches is better than one super church. I do. I think God can handle them better. I mean, if you have one super church and it goes sour, it just wrecks the whole thing. If you have five and two go sour, you still got three. Isn't that better? And I believe there's something to that. You say, well, you just don't have a vision. Yeah, I do. I certainly do. Marcus Haggard loosed the spirit, uh, spirit of enlarged vision on me. <laughs> they know the thing that we need to realize is that the devil, when, the, when God's people begin to march, the devil marches too. And he always tries to join. Don't try to hold on to people. Let them go. I've known more churches that, that when the rattlesnakes, you know, God moved through the place and the rattlesnakes started running out the doors and the people run and grab them. Oh, please come back. Oh, please come cast in your lot with us. Poor things. Bring those rattlesnakes right back into the house. They'd left. Why? Let them go. You say, well, you don't love the people. I sure do. But I'll tell you one thing. When I got born again, from that day on, nobody ever had to ask me to come to church. I went around the world in the army, and nobody ever had to ask me to go to church, but I was in church every time there was church. And I heard some of the sorriest sermons you can imagine. <laughs> I really did. I've asked the Lord, please don't let me ever preach as sorry as some of those chaplains I heard. <laughs> they didn't know nothing. They didn't care nothing. I sat there a lot of time and read my Bible. It was more interesting. I'd suggest you get bored with the sermon. Read your Bible. Now don't meditate. Because <laughs> people have been known to snore when they do that. <laughs> I believe that God's people will find a place. Of course you need to love those who are weak. And you need to help. And you need to strengthen. But I'm just simply saying that some of these, uh, you get 
an old bell cow come in and trying to take over and snorting around well I'll take on any old man in this current church <laughs> or you get some old man come in and said I'll tell you I'm important <laughs> I'll fight any man who says I'm not you're blessed when they leave you say but they took people with them oh good good that, that skimmed off that skimmed off other trouble that you'd had later on Whatever happened to God adding to the church those whom he wanted? Did you know that he sends people in and he gives them time and opportunity. They either settle in or burn out. Here they burn in or burn out. That's right. Let God sort them out. Let God sort his youngins. Pray for one another. Love one another. Certainly. But don't hang on to people. You may be hanging on to problems. Let God do it. Well, they said we heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses. He denied the Bible. <laughs> That's the biggest charge against deliverance. Why the Bible says a Christian can't have a demon? Those people are in error. <laughs> you know they mouth the arguments of demonic forces I'm telling you the truth since I got into this I've had demons say Worley you can't do this because of thus and so and thus and so and thus and so I said well what do you mean I can't do it I just did and then I'd go across the country a thousand miles and be in a meeting some preacher would walk up to me or some glorious Christian and they'd walk up and they'd say now brother Worley I realize that you're sincere but I just have to share this with you now the, the Lord is telling me to tell you this boy I really get my ears ready because I already know I'm going to get it and they began to say word for word the arguments, even the very phrases that the demons have said to me months earlier. Word for word. You say, what do you do? Well, they wouldn't do any good to say, you know, you're saying exactly what the demons say. <laughs> now that's not the way to win friends and influence people, I'll tell you. <laughs> Sometimes I just say, oh, is that right? Well... Uh, that's your opinion and you're entitled to it. Because I don't think they could accept what's really happening. See, they don't know that they're mouthing the arguments of demonic forces against deliverance. And God's got to give us a lot of love and a lot of grace for those who do not understand and those who are willingly blind. You know, I have a lot more... I, I don't have so much um, problems being patient with people who don't understand deliverance as I do preachers. Because you see the preachers are the leaders and if there's a remedy for all those dreadful things that people have not been able to get help from it irritates me, it upsets me because they won't even give deliverance a fair hearing. And they've tried everything in their bag of tricks and then they want to call and say, well, just commit them to the mental hospital. There's nothing else can be done. Well, should we take them over that nervous me? Oh, no, no, you don't want to get involved in anything like that. I've known of people who died of cancer because they didn't want to try anything else. Listen. I remember in, when Jesus scorched out the scribes and Pharisees, in the 23rd chapter of Matthew he said you stand at the door you will not go in yourself neither will you let others who would go in I'm not so upset about them not entering in but it does annoy me when the, when the suffering people are not allowed to at least try and get help because their leaders are telling them oh no don't get involved with that that's utter fanaticism Terrible, terrible, terrible. Verse 12, they stirred up the people, and that's exactly what they'll do. <laughs> Some of you found that out. 
when you went back with the glad news about deliverance? Oh boy. Well, you remember when you you remember when uh, the people, maybe you are one of these persons that fundamental people prayed for you, yearned for you to get saved. They witnessed to you. Every time you turn around, they're sticking a track at you or something. You got to where you couldn't understand to see them. Yuck! Here comes those preachers again. You know, dumb people always preach, preach, preach. They're not preachers. Well, I don't want to. If I wanted to hear a preacher, I'd go to church. You know, of course, you never did. And then you got saved. And oh, what a difference you had. Oh, these dear friends, you know. That, and then they, they probably fed you the scripture and helped you and got you started. And then some of you got off into one of these little house prayer meetings, you know. They just studying the scriptures and praying. And then you found out some funny things that uh, your other friends hadn't mentioned to you. These people are talking in funny languages. You said, what in the world is that? They said, oh, it's in the scripture. Oh, it is? Well, you see, your friends have taught you. Now you believe everything God says. And so when these new friends showed you what was right in the Bible, they said, oh. They said, would you like it? Oh, yeah, yeah, if it's in the scripture. Yep, I know, that's right. You know, if it's, if it's Bible, I ought to get it. And, you know, they laid hands on you, and guess what? Boom, there it was. And you were so excited, you thought, my, my dear friends that led me to the Lord, now I've got something I'm going to share with them, and they didn't know about this. And wait till I tell them. <laughs> They'll be so thrilled. And you remember you went rushing back to, to share this wonderful new thing that you'd found? Oh, they were thrilled, all right. <laughs> Heresy. Oh, you've been all messed up. You've gotten off the base. You know, and, and boy, they didn't react like you thought at all. Now, if you think it was bad then, why do you go home and tell your charismatic friends about deliverance? The reaction against tongues was nothing compared to deliverance. You've got to decide what God says, find out what it is, and then march against the enemy no matter what the cost. They will stir up the people. They did it against Stephen. They brought him into the council. Boy, they brought him on the carpet. And they, they, uh, they set up false witnesses. And these false witnesses said, yes, I heard him. He, he just blasphemes the, the word of God. He blasphemes Moses. It's just terrible. Oh, it's just horrible. I can't stand for my children to be exposed to such dreadful things. And they went on and on. And said, we've heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and change the customs which Moses has delivered to us. Oh, save us from this heresy. Let's get rid of this troublemaker. And uh, Stephen just sat there and said he sat there just steadfastly. His face was like an angel. He just sat there. <laughs> See, he knew something they didn't know. He was full of the Holy Spirit. They were full of prunes. <laughs> well, you know, um, I could tell you my story about that. Just happened to think about it. You know, there was, um, <laughs> there, was <laughs> there were a bunch of crows found, um, uh, four crows found a uh, truck went by and dropped off a box of prunes on the road. <laughs> and, <laughs> so they all got busy eating prunes. And they ate a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> then, they, then they flew up and there was an old field over there and there was a plow sitting there. And they flew up and lit on the plow handle. They all sat there resting, you know. <laughs> so then after a while, the first crow flew off. He flew off to the north and he dropped dead. The second crow flew off to the south and he dropped dead. One flew to the east and he dropped dead. One flew to the west and he dropped dead. And the moral of the story, don't fly off the handle when you're full of prunes. 